this Austin book as opposed to any of our other to write a sequel to? Um, you know, that's a, that's a good question. I think I'm attracted to Pride and Prejudice because of its humor, although Persuasion is my favorite. Um, but I, I think that everybody feels that Mr. Collins married the wrong person, and Lady Catherine is just such a rich field um, to replow. But I, I also felt that there were characters in there, for example, Colonel Fitzwilliam and, and Georgiana, and in fact, I, I am most proud of, of Anne de Bork. Of all, the, of all the characters that I have moved or enriched or built upon or whatever you want to call it, she was, she was a toughie and so was Georgiana. Um, I just, to me, they had a long way to go and they were interesting people. And I guess I just didn't feel that kind of kinship or affinity with, the other people seem somehow more complete. And, you know, they, and also, I think in a very big way, the potential for humor was not there. Um, that was the last part of writing the book, and the part that was clearly the icing on the cake. Yes, I have two questions. The first is, can you say anything about your decision to make Elizabeth and Fitzwilliam childless? They're not. I thought they had no kids. At when the book starts. Oh. Is <laughs> it more incentive to read it? Because um, I've only read the first two chapters. There are two sex scenes, and no one has found them unassisted. But <laughs> <laughs> you know by the end of the book that they've been there. <laughs> um, the other question is, um, and, and this is a, a confession, I'm in the process of doing my own pride and prejudice related fiction, and I'm not a professional writer. And I'm doing this because since I was a kid, and I first read the book, there was always another story, a parallel story going on in my mind as I read the book. What are the pitfalls of intellectual property? You mentioned that before about, you, I gather that you didn't read any other Jane Austen sequels for fear that something would slip in and you'd be accused of plagiarism? I didn't see the, I didn't see the movies. I still haven't seen the one where Mr. Darcy decides to disrobe and bathe in front of his servants and, and, and the people. Um, no. <laughs> I, I, <laughs> yeah, I, you know, I, I fixated with, I, I got to dance with Mr. Darcy, David Rintoul, and we went horseback riding alone, <laughs> that his wife was back at the house. Um, so, the pitfalls. I would not have persevered writing this book had I known the quagmire that was out there now. I, I am I'm deeply, deeply shocked and offended. I know everybody always says that, and then there's, oh, you're winning, sir. Uh, but I am really, truly, deeply shocked and offended. Um, you know, I always thought Clueless was cute. That's the one I saw, and I thought if, if, if Bach came back, he would really, really like Wendy Carlos and switched on Bach. And if Jane Austen came, came back and she could get it at all, she would love Clueless. I just thought Amy Heckerling was brilliant. But I didn't use anything that had anything to do. I, Mr. Knightley makes a cameo. Um, but, you know, I, I, I just don't think I would start. I think you're very brave if you start. I was not brave, I was ignorant, which is better. Um, the other pitfall was that I, I, I... I'm with you, I don't like any of the things out there for the same reasons that you give. I mean, they're just sort of romantic fiction. They really have nothing to do with um, uh, what Jane Austen had in mind in writing her book, number one. But number two, I'm fascinated with the history of the period, and I'm also trying, I just came back from England where I read microfiches of, of the newspapers of the time. So that's- And they're done that. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure you have. You've done much more than I, I have the means to do. But um, I am concerned about any, anything that I would do would be completely, I, I, I want to make sure that I'm not repeating what other people have done. Well, I think the one thing that I would, that, that drove me was I had to get it right. Mm -hmm. I had to get the law right. Mm -hmm. I had to get the language right. I had to get the sentence structure right. And the social history correct. The social history, social geography. I had to get the clothes mm -hmm. right. I had, and I'm a very, I have um, attention surplus disorder. <laughs> um, and I, and so the more that I would find out, I would go, oh crap, that can't happen. Mm -hmm. So then I would go on this other big circuitous thing and come back until I could find some way that it was that it was plausible. And that took 26 years. Mm -hmm. Six. 
not have in the same resources. And the other really good thing about my project was I didn't really have a budget, which helped, believe me. I mean, a lot of these travel books were MOTG, and a lot of those um, manuscript sketchbooks were, were priceless. I mean, you get somebody who's actually contemporaneously describing and making sketches and you can infer what they thought was interesting or important or something. I mean, it, was, it was a wonderful, wonderful thing to be able to do. But one of the things that you might consider doing is writing to be an intern or a fellow at the Chalk House Library will keep you for a month. And you get to use all of that stuff. There's, there's, even, the, there's even the learner room where they haven't filed my book yet because there were 70 500 or something in the end that I said, no, no, you can't file it in the end. I might need them. Did you say you found something called the Dictionary of Thieves and Prostitutes? Mm -hmm. What is that? And it was the Dictionary of, um, was it Thieves, Robbers, and Prostitutes or something like that. And there was, there was a, an 1800 Dictionary of, of Slang of the Common Cant. Um, there was the dictionary. There, I had three or four sporting dictionaries. But where, where did you find? Is it is it the Chalk Library? It is now. <laughs> 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 what was finding at Forty Second Street and, and in, the, in our library? I I don't know that. Okay. Um, I'll, I'll I it. I would expect not. The one thing I would caution you. Um, I did try later in the process to get Google Books. Um, one of the things I ended up doing was being in Africa and needing a copy of, um, I did not bring my two volume 1755 edition of Johnson's Dictionary. It was either that or close. Um, so <laughs> I tried to download it and they're unusable. There are so many errors and, I mean, Johnson's Dictionary was full of exclamation points and root characters and um, I, I, I found that was not um, a useful source. So I, I most of the time did rely on primary sources. Yes, ma'am. Um, how much of the time do you like split your time between England and America, or are you um, like I, I don't know? I mean, because because you do all this stuff in, in Chawton, um, but um, you know, American, I'm assuming from the accent. So, so I I just be curious to know what you know how how you give attention to both. Well, Ava Farmer actually stands for A Virginia Farmer. I have a very large farming establishment in Virginia, and I get to spend nearly enough time. I have a tiny little 16th century mill that I infest right outside Bath. Um, and depending on which tax authority you represent, I will give you a different answer. <laughs> sometimes I'm here, and sometimes I'm there. <laughs> The book is just very much about second impressions. It's it's not about first impressions. For those of you who, who know that was Austin's original title until the ten years it took her to get it published, somebody scooped her. Um, no, I I originally called it something ghastly, which I won't mention. Um, and then sometime second impressions came, and it is very very much a book about second impressions. It's about you know good old Susie the Banshee's line, dare to take a second look. Um, and I just, I thought it, it worked and it also was my, my way of telling the cognoscenti that there might be something more here. Somebody at least knew that much about Jane Austen. So, dare to take a second look. Yes? Um, we spoke a lot about the social economic uh, aspect of the book. Can, um, do you think you were able to capture the lyrical and the emotional appeal of the the prejudice in your work? We must not decide our own performance. <laughs> I, you know, I don't know. It's been called seamless, and it's um, it's been called Austin-esque. But I, I haven't had anybody in a public way fault the writing style as being non-Austin-esque. I've had people fault other things, and I think by and large they were probably right. Um, but I, I, the one thing I hope I got was the humor. 
um, it may be a little subliminal, but I'm, there, there are some parts in there that, that I wanted to be very funny. There are parts of Pride and Prejudice that are hilarious. You look like you don't believe me. <laughs> I haven't heard Morgan. If you have any passages to prove. <laughs> My favorite Jane Austen line, although it's not from Pride and Prejudice, is from her Juvenalia. It's the only time my husband ever kicked me out of bed was when I was reading the Juvenalia and I couldn't quit giggling at two in the morning and I couldn't quit reading you. <laughs> Beware of swoons, dear Laura. A frenzy fit is one quarter so pernicious and I dare say, if taken in moderation, may be advantageous to the health. Run mad as often as you choose, but do not faint. <laughs> Yes. Um, this is kind of an addendum to that young lady's question. I she asked why this was What was the impetus to begin with? Why did you, what made you stand up and say, no, 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 this is not how it's supposed to end. I know how it's supposed to end. And I mean, I, I do not mean any offense by this at all. It, it seems obviously 26 years of, of study can, can justify the, the brightness of when you did this. Um, but it does seem to begin with just a, a tiny bit audacious. What, what, what made you say? Hubris has been used. <laughs> is, is hubris the word you're looking for? But it's certainly not obvious. Um, you know, I, I, had, I had this exact discussion with um, a friend who used the H word. And I said, you know, there are people who followed Rembrandt. There are people who followed Mozart. There are people who followed great men and women because they have a, you know, I. To me, J.M.W. Turner spawned, you know, the entire Impressionist movement. You know, were they J.M.W. Turner? No, I don't think they were. I'm certainly not Austin. But that doesn't mean that you can't find happiness and give happiness in trying to <clears throat> enter that world and, in some sense, emulate what you're what you're able. Um, I en I enjoy Austin because of her deep seated confidence. She was in the best of all places at the best of all times. I mean, she was a white English woman, she was Protestant, and it had never been better, and in fact it hadn't. And she could laugh at that society from that vantage point, because she knew in her heart that it doesn't get any better than this. And I, 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 wanted, to, I wanted to be there, and I wanted to write from, from there, and I wanted to learn what that felt like. Um, is that hubris? Was that audacious? I, you know, I, I would just say that it's, it's, it's it, for me it was scholarship. Um, there's Learner's Theory of Austin, which was first publicly promulgated in 1994 that says that anytime Jane Austen uses a general word like carriage or clothes or dress or, or house, she's talking about carriages, clothes, dresses, and house. Whenever she uses a specific word, she's talking about something else. And when you said that we don't understand what they're writing, that was the whole reason why I started Chatton House Library, because I believed that even though we could read the words, somehow I just had this idea it was going all over our heads. And when I did the carriages work, there are not quite 400 um, mentions of carriages in the novels. It became absolutely crystal clear that if you understand what those words meant at those times, those books change forever for you. Just the word landolette changes the whole ending to persuasion if you know what landolette is. Mm -hmm. And I absolutely believe that at that time for life, at that last novel that she completed, she meant for Mr. Darcy to be a pale shade of Captain Wentworth because of the word landolette. Though I have to say my favorite is Moon's Pies. Anybody? Remember mince pies? Yeah, she was about the mince pies, right? Yeah, now she could have said, I suppose Charlotte had to go. I suppose she was wanted about the mince pies. Okay, so what do you think that says? Not about mince pies. Not even about Charlotte. Mrs. Bennett, remember this is the age of reason. This is the age of the enlightenment. These are people, when you say someone is being unreasonable, it means that they are not, not connected. I mean, unreasonable meant that you were without reason. So Mrs. Bennett is trying to pull one over by putting down Charlotte Lucas and saying men's pies. What were men's pies in the late 18th century? Used 
food. The mince pie was what was created by the housewife, and they always had lots of spices and stuff because it was whatever you had at the end of the week, you threw it in a pastry case and you baked it. Now, what do we know about Charlotte Lucas? We know that her father was so successful in his business that A, he was retired, and B, he had knighthood. He lives at Lucas Lodge. If anybody knows what a lodge is, it's like a grange. It's a big house. It just doesn't happen to have an estate attached to it. All right. So what is the probability that the Lucases are eating the equivalent of hash and their eldest daughter is preparing it? So what has Jane Austen done? She has made Mrs. Bennet ridiculous and shown that Mrs. Bennet in her unreasonable and ignorant attempt to one up the Lucases actually defeats her own purpose. I'm sure all of you guys got that out of that, didn't you? <laughs> so when you find these things, it changes what, how you read that forever. And I would, I almost want to use the term beg, go pick up one of those novels and see if you can stop yourself from just flying through them because they're so, they're, they're just like stopping yourself from eating like the top of the hostess cupcake. Um, look for the specific word, because she could have said, I suppose Charlotte was wanted about the dinner. I suppose Charlotte was wanted about the housekeeping. I suppose Charlotte was wanted to help her mother. She did. She said mince pies, and she said land of wet. And there's a lot of other times, um, another really great one, is when you look at the day that Lady Catherine chooses to call on Elizabeth Bennet. Lady Catherine, who is so concerned with money, she is basically so out of her mind. She is deranged over this idea that Elizabeth Bennet might marry her nephew. She's just basically standing there ripping up $100 bills. When you look at what it cost her to come post without writers, okay, this was the equivalent of getting in a Learjet today. Okay, you're really bugged, something's going on in California, and you, you charter a Learjet or, you know, a G4. All right, I mean, you could not dissipate money at a faster rate traveling at that time. It was the most expensive way to travel possible. And she's just ripping up pound notes because, and, and Austin, Austin is doing this. She mentions outriders. She mentions livery. She mentions the horses were post. All right? She's telling you Lady Catherine is deranged. <coughs> and she has basically come unhinged in her concern over this putative turn of events. So it's, it's, it's a very interesting thing um, to go back in and to read those things. I did it with carriages this last year and a half. I've done it with money. Um, and it's a, it's a very different world. It's, it's very different than, than I think most of us, most of us read. What's the ending in Persuasion? If you back up just a tiny bit, it said, you know, <coughs> true, um, Anne had no um, upper cross before her, but Elizabeth is uh, um, Mary is somewhat jealous when she sees her sister and the mistress of a very pretty landolette. What's a landolette? Carriage does not count. What's a landolette? And this is one of the places where Austin gets herself into trouble over money. But if you want to hear that one, you'll have to come to, come to the jazz meeting. If you look at landolette and you reflect, in my view, what persuasion is about, it's about independence and women's independence. Because throughout the book, first Anne is waiting to be picked up by Lady Russell. Um, she doesn't have a way to get to Bath. She, you know, everybody is trying to jockey for a position in the coach to Lyme. She, you know, is trying, Captain Wentworth puts her on the vehicle, you know, when she's tired. Mary can't go to Bath until it's her mother-in-law's party. If you look at it, it's, it keeps coming back to that recurring theme about and, and Mary says this a number of times, I don't have to go anywhere. 
You know, everybody's always having fun, and I'm sitting here, and oh, he's off hunting, and I'm sitting here. It's very much about that, and at the end of the novel, she throws Landolette in there. What is a Landolette? It's a lady's vehicle. It's a lady's town vehicle. It's a lady's town vehicle that a man can't be in, basically. You know, in the 70s, for those of you who are old enough to have been alive then, remember those tiny, tiny little Mercedes 190 SLs? And they came in beautiful peach and apricot and mauve, you know, and they, they were just itty bitty little convertible sports cars, okay, and they came in powder blue and pink. That's what a landaulet is, and a man would not be seen driving in it. And not only that, but as it's a landau, it's coachman driven, okay, it's not owner driven, all right. Remember Elizabeth Darcy and her aunt are going to go around the park in Fayettes. That's an owner driven vehicle, Pony Fayette. Ladies, owners, okay, you're talking about a landolette that has to have a coachman, at least one footman, and it's a vehicle he can't even ride in. Okay, I think it's the wrong vehicle. Um, it's a town vehicle, but it's not a general purpose car. He's giving her, you know, the equivalent of this tiny, itty bitty little bright pink Mercedes. All right, Captain Wentworth is not going to be tooling around the, you know, the place in like, you know, the, the Aqua Harley or the pink Mercedes. And, and he gives his wife independence. It's a lady's vehicle. She can come and go when she wants to. And it's an enormous proportion of his disposable income. Landolette's about 150 pounds. We know if he, she says in one place he makes 20,000 pounds in the army, in another place 25. So consider he's got somewhere between 800 and 1,000 pounds disposable income. The landolette's 150 pounds, and depending on what town they're in, because it's a town vehicle, and she makes a mistake, depending on what town they're in, even just the horses and the livery for that would run easily to two or 300 pounds a year. So that is an enormous proportion of his disposable income that he's giving to his wife for the sole purpose of allowing her to be independent. She's got her own wheels. <laughs> now what do you think of Captain Wentworth? <laughs> so again, she didn't say mistress of a new marriage, you know, a carriage for her marriage. She didn't say, um, at, you know, another place where the carriage is really, really, really important to, to establish um, social, social um, comparisons is, is in Mansfield Park, um, where, um, Edmund gets into the squabble about his carriage versus his mother's carriage versus Mr. Crawford's. It's, and she, she knew about those things, and she uses them to interplay and to make people mean or um, threatened in this case. So it's, it's, a, it's a long, strange trip. <laughs> Sorry, I, I could go on like this for, like, until next Tuesday. Yeah. Yeah. Tell us just a little bit, uh, because I know that you started reading these books when you were a child on your family's farm, and when you read the books, you turned them upside down and read them again, you know. Uh, this is my promoter. <laughs> <laughs> but what I'm interested, the more I know you and the longer I know you, are, are these circular lives that you lived uh, in science with the rubber, in farming, in writing, music, and all, all of that. Talk, talk to us a little bit about your approach to life. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know if I'm qualified. Um, you know, I just, I, by the time I, my, my, my father used to say, you're a long time dead. Um, you know, by the time I'm done with my life, it's going to be tired. Okay. I, I, I keep living it over and over again. But I'm, I quit now. Um, I, I am thinking about writing a sequel to the sequel. <laughs> do you call it a trequel? Yeah. <laughs> or because it's two, do you, is it a quadquel? <laughs> but you just said you wouldn't do it over again. Well, I wouldn't do this over again. Oh. I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't do this. But I, I have sent the Wiccans to America. And it's because after all of this time, I came to the shameful realization that I know very much more about English economics and history than I know about American. And I thought, well, I could, I could like spend the next 25 years figuring out <laughs> what the Wickhams would do, in, and I sent them to Virginia. Um, but I, I don't know, the, the longer I look at that, the less fun it, 
it seems. I, I, I have another project that I think sounds more fun. So I'll tell you one last story. Um, I was in Africa trying to finish this book um, about a year and a half ago, and on a private island, because a friend of mine has some works in charity for, this, for the oceans and knows the person who manages this private island. So I was sitting there and I was writing. Of course, everybody else in the private island is sunbathing and drinking and having a good time. I'm sitting there, of course, writing. And there was this enormous Russian woman who had jumped ship 20 years before on some research vessel. She was the cook and just stayed on this island. And she was basically about four of these podiums. And in about that, in about that geometry, and her name was, was Glasha Ullman, and she says, why you sit here and you work all day? Everybody else out in the stream, they have good time. What are you doing? I said, oh, Glasha, I'm, I'm trying to finish a book. Well, what are you book about? And I go, well, I, I know that in Russia they like Jane Austen because I know all the novels have been translated. I'm reading a sequel to Pride and Prejudice. Do you read Jane Austen? Oh, I love Jane Austen. I keep the novels by my bed. I read them at least once a year. She is my favorite author. And I go, oh, well, would you like to read my sequel? She goes, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I email her the PDF file. And she comes back a few days later and I go, hey, Glosh, what'd you think? <laughs> I think you need the right sequel. Glosh, it is a sequel. No, 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 you need the right sequel. Pause and prejudice. <laughs> Creeping tale of love between cat and dog. <laughs> cat family hate dog family, dog family hate cat family. A mafia, mafia kidnap cat. <laughs> uh, lots of gunfire, car crashes, you know, um, violence everywhere, but dog save cat and they get married. <laughs> because he's Austin. <laughs> so I think that pause and prejudice sounds like a lot more fun than writing the Virginia Secret. Yeah. You know, hey, if you can do vampires and zombies, I think you can do cats and dogs. <laughs> well, thank you Great. very much. Uh,